Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. You are listening to the Trek Ranks Podcast, a member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. This is episode 55, featuring the top five Discovery Season 2 moments. Welcome, Star Trek fans. I am Jim Morehouse, and I am the host of the Trek Ranks Podcast. And tonight, we're coming to you live from somewhere deep beneath the surface of Talos 4, where we're going to try and break down our top five moments from Discovery's amazing second season, which just finished. It was... I mean, what a season. What can you say? It's good. I, I feel like it's close to impossible to try to uh, narrow this season down to only five items, but that's what we do here at Trek Ranks, so no one ever said it was going to be easy. And, you know, what a year at Trek we're currently in the midst of. So we got this now, and we got the Picard series coming up soon. It's amazing time to be talking about Star Trek, and with us tonight to go through Discovery Season 2 are a couple of operatives from Section 31 and a couple of Trek Regs veterans, Alexander Perry and Heather Kirby. Welcome back to the show, guys. Thank you for having me. Yes, Heather. Great, great to have you back on for your second appearance. <laughs> I feel like I've come full circle. Like my first appearance was with Alex, and now I'm back on with Alex. So we're going to have fun tonight. So Heather was on our episode 42 our top five voyager guilty pleasure episodes and also on that episode was alexander perry who's been on a few times for he was on our season one discovery breakdown alex and our turbo lift scenes and i'm sure plenty of others evening jim i am broadcasting to you from the 31st century <laughs> oh spoiler alert black <laughs> alert and he's the host of uh, weekly trek here on the tricorder transmissions anyway we're gonna have a blast talking discovery i can't wait so let's jump into our trek ranks recalibration so we don't waste any time getting into tonight's topic what are you recalibrating everything um it's, it's a sweeping, uh, a recalibration of all systems. I would be fascinated to observe this recalibration, Doctor. As regular listeners will know, general order number one here at Trek Ranks is that we love Trek. We love to rank Trek via some deep dive topics just to get the conversation started. But what is that Vulcan motto? Um, infinite diversity. In infinite combinations. Hmm. <laughs> and what is diversity? But a celebration of differences. And as to Paul and Dr. Flox just said, our mantra here at Trek Ranks is no wrong answers. Trek Ranks is just a massive celebration of differences. Our show is about all the reasons we love Star Trek. We're not here to nitpick or to argue, but just to celebrate the greatness of Trek. We love it all from TOS to TNG, straight through to Enterprise and the Kelvin timeline and now Discovery as well. It's all fair game here on the Trek Ranks podcast. Black alert. Black alert. And a quick reminder that Discovery spoilers are definitely in play tonight. So most of you probably heard that before, but we like to reset every week for any newcomers jumping into Trek ranks for the first time. And on that note, a reminder that our entire back catalog is available for you to download and listen to at trekranks.com and at the tricordertransmissions.com. Because one of the beauties of our show is that each episode is pretty timeless and you can listen and re-listen to our shows in any order you want. So if you haven't gone back to listen to any of our old episodes, we definitely encourage you to do that. Hailing frequencies are open. And you can find Trek Ranks on the interface links at trekranks.com. And you can contact me directly on Twitter at trekranks or at Enterprise Extra. You can also call and leave us a message with your own picks at 609-512-LLAP at 609-512-5527. And at the end of the show, you will find out why you should be doing that. And Alex and Heather, uh, how can people get a hold of you guys on the net access interface? Alex? You can find me on Twitter at Alexander T. Perry, and you can also find me weekly at the Tricorder Transmissions weekly new show, Weekly Trek, which you can also find on Twitter at Weekly Trek. All right. How about you, Heather? 
the easiest place to find me is on Twitter. It's at nerdygal33. And it, my profile name is never apologize for being nerdy because that's something no one should ever apologize for. Totally agree. And yeah, check out Weekly Trek on Tricorder Transmissions weekly news show that uh, where we're, Alex breaks it all down and uh, spins through all the, the crap news stories that aren't real news out there. So, all right, let's jump into our level one diagnostic and get this topic rolling. Diagnostic cycle will be complete in 20 seconds. And as we always do for topics of this type, this week's diagnostic cycle is actually pretty critical in terms of how we made our picks. So this week, we're not just doing a standard uh, five random items that we want to highlight as our top five moments. Instead, we're categorizing and defining and rounding out a little bit more ground. So here's how we're going to break down our top five discovery season two moments and all the different categories that we're using. Round five, we're each going to pick our favorite production design element. So that can be Anything like your favorite ship or a prop or a costume or the score or visual effects, whatever you want. In round four, we're going to choose our top performer or actor. So this topic is all about the best performance on the screen, but also off screen in terms of your selection. So just it could be the, how they connected with Trek and fans or just their acting, whatever, however you want to pick them, but it's about the performer. Round three is the Daba round. It's our complete wild card round, so you can pick anything you want. Round two is all about your favorite character, the character that you want to highlight from season two, so you can pick that however you want. And round one is clear. It's what we do here at Trek Ranks. We're picking our favorite episode of the season. And then in our secondary system, as always, we'll get a few more outline picks. All right, let's jump into our prime director so we can find out how Alex and Heather defined their picks. I do not concur with your captain's decision. She's following our prime directive. Define prime directive. All right, Heather, how about you? How did you break down your picks in your prime directive to uh, come up with your overall list? Well, my prime directive when looking at my list was that I wanted to make sure I covered as much as possible because mm. I love discovery and I love talking about discovery. And especially with the different categories, you could potentially talk about something uh, that happened in one episode in every single category. So you're only talking about one episode. So I wanted to make sure that each of my rounds featured a different episode. I love that. So you are going to make sure you touch as many corners of the season as you can. That is great. I actually failed there in a couple of spots. So that's interesting. Going to be uh, cool. Alex, how about you? How'd you break it down? I also failed at that. I think I set out <laughs> with the intent to do that. And then there were a couple of episodes I just kind of found myself keep coming back to so i did my best to spread it around but ultimately for me it just came down to when i thought about it you know what kind of rose to the top for me and 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 it actually wasn't that difficult for me to 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 pick my final choices i am pretty similar to alex i just kind of brainstormed and went with my the ones that kind of rose to the top and, and were my favorites there's a couple that i really battled over and there's one pick that I'm not even sure yet what it's going to be because in my notes, I have it split between two things and we're going to pick it at the moment. So when we get to it, I'm going to decide which one we're going with. Let's jump into the order of things. I am a Jem'Hadar. He is a Vorta. It is the order of things. Just a quick reminder on how we're going to go through the order of things. First, each of us will reveal our five-word summary and a hashtag for our selections. And after we reveal our selection for each of our topics and, and the episode as well, as so we're going to highlight an episode for each of our, our picks, then we'll uh, yeah, highlight our pick and talk about why, uh, why we chose it. And at the end, again, we'll try and get a few secondary system selections uh, out there just to see what uh, maybe just missed our list. And if we have any duplicate picks, make sure to listen for the Defiant Torpedoes. Alex, let's start with you for round five. We're doing our favorite production design element. What do you have? Okay. 
Five word summary. Iconic design retains horrific edge. Hashtag beep. My selection for production design element is the Pike Chair from Through the Valley of Shadows, season two, episode 12. Oh. Wow. <laughs> nice. I mean, what an update to an iconic design from the 60s. I mean, the menagerie, when you first see Pike um, in the chair, uh, you know, there is this really kind of horrific element to it, the idea that this man has been laid low and is, and is confined to this chair. And I'd always had this kind of question in my mind of, well, they're doing Pike, are they going to find a way to, uh, to kind of allude to what, his future would be and there are a couple of moments during the season where that happened but then in this episode we just got a full-on kind of look at it and I have to say it was a really nice update of the original design I mean obviously it's not quite the same in every single detail as the chair as it appeared in the menagerie but it was a very faithful kind of update of the original design the makeup was really good and just the whole scene in which it appeared was just a really chilling scene frankly uh, that has sat with me since I watched it um, I, the scene was playing out and I was going are they gonna do it are they gonna do it oh my god they're doing it oh my god they're doing it oh that's disgusting oh that's disgusting I can't look away <laughs> so just a just a really really nice design element and I think you know one of those places where the discovery production designers really kind of landed home on how do you keep a design faithful to the original 1960s appearance without it being an exact copy um, given the you know different aesthetic of discovery and the updated production values of the 21st century yeah amazing pick i could not agree more with how you described it and that scene which we're definitely going to talk about it again later, but I'm still sobbing about that scene. Just the fact that we've seen that and we, and they, they showed it to us in such a perfect way, but, but the chair, when you see it over his shoulder coming into frame, Oh my God, what an iconic Trek moment. Incredible. And totally agree with you. The design is, uh, it's pretty much perfect the way they did it. Heather, what's your take? Oh, you definitely hit it spot on. It was an incredible moment, and the design was just, and it, it, it was one of those moments throughout the season, especially when dealing with Pike, where uh, the, the design of things just puts you right back in that episode in the 1960s, even though you're watching a brand new episode in 2019. So, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfection. Okay, awesome. I didn't even think about that one at all, so I love that pick. Heather, what's your uh, production design element pick? Okay, five-word summary. Merging vintage with today's style. Hashtag making space butts look fine. <laughs> it is the wardrobe design of Gersha Phillips, uh, specifically in the season two premiere, Brother. So Ooh, love it. what I am specifically talking about is the design of the constitution class uniforms uh from the enterprise because just it, it was one thing especially how they introduced it in the episode when they beamed onto the discovery and you saw the three different colors right there in front of you and it just gave me chills looking at uh, that like this is this is the Enterprise. This is real. Yeah. This is their uniforms. And she did such a wonderful job with essentially taking the style that she had created for the Discovery uniforms and applying that to their uniforms while still keeping the color palette from the original series. So, Yeah. No, you couldn't describe it better. I love the pick of Brother because you kind of forget now that we lived with them for a season, but that's kind of our first look at them. Yeah. And that transporter scene, they just popped. Oh my God, they popped. I love it. And every time they kind of showed up again, like even especially at the end when Pike's in the the full uh yellow command. Uh they're so cool. They just look so good. Alex, what's your take on the uniforms from and the design from Gersha Phillips? Another perfect integration of the aesthetics between Discovery and the original series. I mean, yeah. you really do see that kind of bridging of the gap between the two of them. 
Um, and Jim, as you say, you know, towards the end of the season, when you're on the Enterprise in those scenes in Such Sweet Sorrow and everybody on the bridge is in the, is in the kind of, um, uh, the three colors, it, it, you know, in addition to the lovely design for the Enterprise bridge, it, it you know, it, it, in some respects, you do feel like you are losing yourself in terms of watching a, a, a classic Star Trek episode because you have the bold colors right in front of you. You have the soundscape that you would anticipate. And, um, it was just really, really special. And so it was great anytime we got the opportunity to see those uniforms. Love that pick. All right. My production design pick, five words and a hashtag, ancient ball of dying knowledge, hashtag weird sphere. And my production design element is the dying, maybe sentient data sphere from the introduced in the episode in Oval for Charon. And I love this crazy design not just because it's kind of this it's super unique for what it represented being and it's it's actually almost it's kind of even hard to describe it's like this fiery decaying ball of massive just awesomeness i I love it when the the first time you see it when uh, the tiny little discoveries kind of nose to nose with it but the thing i love about the sphere is the way it was utilized almost as kind of the linchpin to the entire season. I'm a huge fan. I've tweeted about this. I'm a huge fan of stories about knowledge and the danger of how much knowledge is, is too much while balancing that against the fact that if at any point in time you're trying to deny somebody knowledge, that sucks, right? I mean, what the hell? Everybody has a right to learn and access knowledge. So I always think it's a really interesting question when you're trying to to limit knowledge uh, for, for people. I think it's a cool dichotomy in storytelling and in the real world too, like with AI, people are like, Oh, AI, but it's like, well, we're not going to make computers do the, the most we can do. Why would we deny ourselves that? But AI is coming. So <laughs> who knows? anyway, I, uh, I love this sphere, the amazing effects every time it showed up. And I just love that it was kind of rough kept, being referenced over and over again and ultimately was uh, kind of the key to the jump into the 31st century. So uh, Alex, what's your take on the, the data sphere? I love this. We just spent two picks talking about production design elements where the production designers had some kind of source material off of which to to work. Right. Whereas this is something totally original to Discovery. And the design was amazing. I mean, that first shot when Discovery comes out of warp and it's kind of trapped in the orbit of this sort of roiling kind of planet-like structure was uh, was really quite iconic. And as you say, the way that that entity then played a role in the rest of the season, you know, it, when you first watched it, I remember coming away from that episode feeling like, oh, that was a cool kind of one-off. I mean, it, right. you sort of got the sense that the Saru story in that episode was the one that was potentially more important for the plot of the season. And then as the season goes on, you're like, no, the sphere keeps coming up again and again and again. And the data that they've collected, you know, I thought that final scene in the episode where they say, well, it'll take Federation scientists generations to to sift through all this data was going to be one of those, like, and now we fly off into the future and never hear from it again. Yeah. So really nice that they managed to make that an element uh, that persisted throughout the show and, and just a really cool concept and really well executed. Yeah, I love it. Heather, what was your take on it? Like Alex said, it, it's something when you first watch the episode that you think, oh, that's kind of cool, but it's not going to get brought up again. But after watching season one, you should know that every single thing they do in Discovery is important. Yeah. <laughs> and they prove that with this sphere. And it, it's, um, I think it, it was really awesome because it, it also challenged the idea of what another thing that also comes up in Star Trek a lot as to what actually makes someone or uh, a being sentient and what actually makes uh, someone have free will uh, because it just seemed like a big rock to them until they finally realized that it, it was alive and it wasn't right. trying to hurt them and it just wanted to spread its knowledge somewhere before it died. So, um, yeah. yeah. I, I love it and I love the... 
think it's probably still going to be uh, a part of uh, the 31st century <laughs> in season three. It very well could. <laughs> yeah, their ability to access that info. So, okay, uh, let's move on to round four. Our top performer or actor, Alex. What's your round four pick? So, five word summary. I can love another Spock. Hashtag. Do you think the beard is working for you? My pick is Ethan Peck, and the episode that I selected for Ethan Peck was the Red Angel episode uh, nine of season two. I uh, love it. Sonequa Martin Green, I think, is the best performer on Star Trek Discovery, but I think Ethan Peck had the biggest challenge to overcome for season two of Discovery, and that's why I really wanted to highlight him. You know, this was a tough job when the uh, season when the first season ended and enterprise appeared my kind of initial reaction was okay but the last thing i want is another spark you know i'm excited to see the enterprise but i i don't want to see spark i don't think i have um space in my heart to add another spark to Leonard Nimoy's performance in the prime timeline. And then from the first appearance of Ethan Peck and going all the way through the end of the season, you know, he just blew me away with his performance. I think it was, it was a, uh, it was extremely faithful to Leonard Nimoy's performance as Spark. Um, Ethan talked in some of his interviews about how you know, he had spent a lot of time studying Leonard Nimoy's performance as the character. And I think that really, really shows in, in, in what came through. Um, and I picked the Red Angel because there is there are so many really nice scenes between Spock and Burnham throughout the whole of the show. Um, but I really like the Red Angel because it 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 flipped the dynamic in which we went from from kind of episode seven and episode eight, in which Burnham was the one helping Spock to now Spock was in the position to help Burnham. And I just thought Ethan did such a really fabulous job. Um, with a lot of those scenes uh, in bringing the the humor of the character you know Vulcans are difficult characters to play we know because there are plenty of terrible Vulcans uh, in the Star Trek franchise and those but those actors who've done it right have done it in a way where you can portray a character that has this kind of steely unemotional exterior but can still convey a lot of emotion through not necessarily a very performative uh, performance. Um, so for me, it was Ethan Peck because, you know, I started off the season being a hard no on the idea of seeing another spark and I've ended it wanting more from this actor as this character. Yeah, exactly the same. I love this pick. Ethan Peck was amazing in this role. Heather, what's your, what's your quick take? Ethan Peck was incredible. I mean, I, I, I it, it such big shoes to fill to come into a, a like such a legendary role like Spock um that's probably the one character throughout the Star Trek universe that everyone knows uh everyone has some sort of opinion of everyone he's, he's pretty much universally loved and so to come into a, a role of a character like that you you know you, you have big shoes to fill and you have a big task ahead of you. And, and Ethan Peck really knocked it out of the park. Yeah, there were, and you're right. This is a great choice for it too. Cause there was two or three key Burnham Spock scenes. The one where she's uh, in the sick bay and Spock's basically describing how uh, uh, irresponsible she is. <laughs> she's like, thanks for that. Thanks for sharing that with the group. Love that moment. Love all their interaction. And they had that Cisco moment, too, where she was fighting the uh, the punching bag, getting out her aggressions. And Spock came in, and, and uh, they had a great little moment. So awesome pick for the Red Angel. Love Ethan Peck. If you haven't listened to Anson Mount's podcast interview of Ethan Peck, the Well podcast, I highly recommend everybody do that. It's an incredible two-part interview to get to, to know that actor. Okay, Heather, how about you? What's your round four pick for top performer or actor? So I went a little bit of the opposite direction from Alex and went with someone who I really enjoy off screen, probably a little bit more than I enjoy on screen. No, that's cool. That's how I kind of picked it last time. So, so um, my five word summary is radiates joy in every interview. Hashtag mother knows best. 
and it is Mary Chifo. Oh, that's fantastic. Our Chancellor Laurel. Yes, that is a great pick because she just, oh my God, she just makes you feel so connected to the fandom the way she is. She she does. She is she is so excited to be a part of Star Trek and to yeah. play this amazing character. And she's so well connected to her character. Like I, I'm pretty sure she knows her character more than we actually know her character, <laughs> which kind of sucks for us. But it's good for her when she. <laughs> when she's portraying her on screen and she she just she's such a fan she's a fan along with everybody else and i'm so glad to have her as part of our star trek cast so what episode did you pick i'm dying Um, to hear because i I was going to reference one but want to see what you picked first well she was in three episodes yeah uh, in the season i think the one where she got to shine the most was episode three points of light okay cool because i was going to reference how great was that <laughs> those scenes with her in such sweet sorrow oh my god so she was saying, i mean when she said today's a good day to die that was epic alex what's your take on the, the great mary chifo amazing i mean is there any member of this cast who is more excited that they're a uh, part of Star Trek than Mary Chifo? I don't think so. You know, the she's fabulous in, in every interaction she has with the fans, in her fabulous appearance on the screen, um, just a really, really talented actress and and so warm and so giving, which, you know, given social media is not always the most friendly place to be, uh, is a real credit to her, you know, for being such a, a, a positive member of the cast when, you know, for any of these guys, frankly, it would be pretty easy for them just to, just to not go on social media entirely and not kind of interact with the fans because there is a toxic element that's out there. So all the more credit to her for that and so much credit for just being such a, such a joy to, uh, to interact with. Yeah, she is an inspiration. Love that pick. Good deep cut pick, Heather. All right, my round four pick for top performer, five words and a hashtag. By the way, I did not go that route. I went more of the Alex route. Five words and a hashtag. The variance is you, Michael. Hashtag mom. And it is Sonequa Martin-Green who just slays me as Michael Burnham. And I also picked the Red Angel for my my episode. She's definitely my favorite character. I picked her as my character in season one, and I picked Jason Isaacs as my performer actor in season one, more for his off-screen antics than uh, as much as his on-screen. So this time I switched it up a bit because I feel like highlighting Sonequa Martin-Green's performance as Burnham was just something essential i had i just could not let that one go she's obviously the lead of the series and has a lot on her shoulders but it's just the way she leads the cast and the crew it's it's amazing when you and when when you hear the way her co-stars talk about her it's it's really uh pretty inspiring but on screen her performances are just brilliant and i considered picking i mean she had so many strong performances but i considered picking if memory serves, perpetual infinity and project dataless as well, but ultimately went with the red angel because of just how she conveyed that emotional turmoil when she finds out that her parents had been working on this uh, time travel suit and how they actually had died. And yeah, it's just amazing. I, I think in this episode she has five or six scenes where there's literally tears in her eyes and she's like fighting her way through it. It's, it's pretty epic. She's an amazing actress and an amazing uh, ambassador for Star Trek and leading this series. Love her. Heather, what's your take on SMG? She's incredible. I mean, they, they, they picked well when they cast their Michael Mm -hmm. Burnham uh, because she, she's shown over the past, uh, two seasons to be a leader on screen and off screen and it, it's inspiring to watch it really is yeah alex how about you huge fan of sonequa martin green as i said 
I think you're hundred percent right. She is the best performer in Star Trek Discovery, hands down, bar none, no contest. The the scenes that she's had to do this season, the performances that she's been required to give, honestly, some of the material was elevated by the performance. Yeah. You know, there are moments in which she kind of carries the entire weight of the scene on her shoulders and does it, you know, really, really spectacularly in a way that a less capable actress in that role would maybe flounder. And I think we maybe wouldn't necessarily enjoy some of the episodes as much if if we didn't have such a strong powerhouse of a performance at the top. Her position as being the leader of the cast, again, as you said, Jim, is really fabulous to see. I'm really pleased that that you picked her because she is the the top performer on the show. Absolutely, 100%, no question. Yep, love it. And that girl can cry at the drop of a hat. It's impressive. <laughs> it's quite the skill. <laughs> it's amazing. I was so gonna say amazing. I can cry at the drop of a hat. Okay, all right. <laughs> Actually, I can too. So <laughs> and I do quite often. Okay, let's go to the Dabo round, round three, the soup round. Alex, what is your Dabo round pick? Okay, so my five-word summary is books getting love they deserve. Hashtag control Una brighter star. Uh, great. And my episode pick is Such Sweet Sorrow Part 2, the season finale. This has been a really fabulous uh, season for book fans. If you read the Star Trek novels, there have been a number of really nice little call-outs to Star Trek novels uh, in this season, little concepts that maybe the writers have borrowed. So that's true in the case of Control. The Section 31 computer program first appeared in a novel by David Mack, Section 31 Control. The concept behind Control in that novel is a bit different than how it was executed in Discovery, but was still a really kind of exciting moment in Point of Light where Leland mentions control for the first time and it, it it took a few episodes for me to be like did he really was it really to do with the book or was that you know <laughs> like something else and and we wavered back and forth on it and then finally no it you know it, it's an artificial intelligence program that is it's kind of similar in execution in uh, but my favorite moment bar none uh, is one that we just got confirmation on from a Trek core interview with Michelle Paradise um, in which uh, there's just a just a really quick throwaway moment in the season finale in which Pike calls number one Una. When we hear her name at the end of the episode, you know, when they say, who are you? She says her name is number one. Um, but we do hear that name. And and it, and it even though the, the captions for that scene don't say Una, they say something else. Michelle Paradise confirmed that that was her name. And that's the name that the character has been given in the Star Trek novels. Um, so that was really super exciting to see. Um, and then we've also gotten uh, some uh, crossover overs and call outs of the Star Trek Discovery novels. One in particular, the uh, the Tilly novel, The Way to the Stars. Um, there's a scene in, uh, I think it's in Project Daedalus, in which uh, Tilly mentions one time she had a rebellious streak at the age of 16 and ran away from home, and that's that's that story. So really nice to see the writer's room being open to using concepts from the novels and and some of the great ideas that are in there, and, and in some cases adapting them, or in some cases just applying them directly to and, and making them uh, part of the Star Trek canon. That's just been something that's been really nice this season, uh, you know, and, and and who knows how much of that kind of stuff we'll get going forward, right? One of the fabulous things about the way the season ends is it ends with what seems to be an entirely blank slate going so far into the future, you know, no, with the exception of the, of the short Trek Calypso, no kind of Star Trek canon has gone that far into the future. Even, you know, even the temporal Cold War arc didn't, didn't get that far down the line. Um, so, you know, we probably won't get so many quote unquote canon connections or, or references to other Star Trek products uh, in the third season, um, just by virtue of where they are in the timeline. So super great that we had as many as we did this season and just really, really nice that we got some book call outs. That is why we do the Dabo round, because that is a deep cut pick, and it is pretty cool. And yeah, I know you love that book, Control. As soon as that episode aired, I've kind of stopped reading books over the last few years. I just haven't had time. But I immediately bought that book, and I've been slowly going through it. So about halfway through, it's really good. 
a really good Star Trek novel. Heather, what's your take on those deep cut book connections? I think it's awesome. I haven't read as many Star Trek novels as I wish, uh, but I have read all the Discovery related ones. So to see connections from those books show up in the show, like there was also a connection from uh, Desperate Hours when they talked about uh, how Michael was waiting wanted to see a supernova, a Stargo supernova, and that's how her parents died. That was from Desperate Hours, as well as the Way to the Stars connection that Alex mentioned. And uh, Una was named in the book Desperate Hours as well. So, cool. yeah, it, it, it's just really awesome to see those different connections because especially when you read books connected to a universe, you, you want, as much as they're not, everyone says they're not canon, you want to see some validation of what you're reading, that, that it, it's still the same universe. And, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely not canon, but it's nice when there's connections for sure. Yeah. yeah. I have read about, probably about 30 or 40 Trek books. Alex has read about 250. <laughs> Alex, how I have read I have read a few. That is yeah, okay. All right, he's read basically all of them. Everyone, Alex, quick question. So, in the Red Angel, in that awkward scene with Giorgio, Stamets, Colbert, and Tilly, Giorgio confronts Tilly about who raised you, and she's like, "My mom," but she wasn't around much. Was that a was that from that uh, Brightest Star book as well? No, not Brightest Star. Uh, the Way to the Stars. And yes, it is. Yeah, yes. I figured it was. I figured. Yeah. It was. So, and and also, you know, because you see in Runaway that Tilly and her mom have a pretty distant relationship. Of course, yeah. mom is like pretty demanding, and that relationship is explored in much much more detail in the book. And it, it's, I guess, Tilly lives with her grandmother rather than with her mother because her mother's a high-profile Federation diplomat. Um, so, yeah, that that totally tracks with the novel as well. Yeah, I figured it did. Okay, deep cut pick. Love it. Heather, what's your Dabo round pick? Okay, uh, five-word summary. Not every cage is a prison. Hashtag nor every loss eternal. Oh. And for the double round, I decided to go a little bit more broad than Alex's deep cut pick. I'm but already my, tearing up. I'm already tearing up. My well, my pick is actually the exploration and character development of Captain Christopher Pike. Oh, I love it. Well, I love your five words and hashtag was uh chill inducing love it uh yeah so explain your pick that's that's awesome well like especially going into season two I, I i thought it was fitting that pike deserved his own round here because he was kind of the wild card going into season two he was a character who is already known in the star trek universe but he's only ever been seen on two episodes and uh in the Kelvin movies, so in a different alternate universe, and they could either score a home run with using this character in season two, or it could have ended very badly, and they scored a home run. They just added so much depth to him. Uh, you find out more about his backstory, you find out more about his motivations, how he had to sit out the Klingon war and yeah. he feels like he has to prove himself because he didn't get a chance to do it during the war. And then you find out basically the depth of his character that he's willing to sacrifice his future to Incredible. save the universe. And that, that's actually my episode pick for this is Through the Valley of Shadows yep. uh, because just watching him watch that moment and like be completely horrified by it, but then reaffirm who he is, that he's a Starfleet captain. He believes in, in, in sacrifice and compassion and love, and this is what he does, and he's going to do it anyway. Uh, it, like, you can't help but watch that moment and just be eternally proud of this character that you're watching on screen. Yeah, I'm, I love that you picked this. I And Alex already talked about a little bit with Through the Valley of the Shadows, but now's a good time to... To talk about it, that, I mean, the moment, when they showed that moment, 
And, you know, when I'm watching, I think people who listen kind of know, I don't really do predictions. I don't try to think about what's coming. I kind of just let the show wash over me without any kind of preconceptions about what might be coming. So it's just all fresh and I just let them tell the story that they want to tell. And then I judge it based on that. And so I wasn't expecting to see the Pike story, the, the accident, the, the Academy accident. And when it started happening on screen, I mean, literally, and I was kind of set up, but within like five seconds, I was like, are they going to show this? Wait, they're showing this. Oh my God, I'm about to see this. We're going to see this moment that I've lived with for 50 years, you know, in the back of my head thinking I'd never see it and never thinking I'd ever have a chance to see it, even when watching Pike all this entire season. So just floored me. The, the development of that character is one of the best things about season two of Discovery, full stop. It's amazing. Uh, Alex, what's your take on it? Uh, my take is that uh, we will talk about Captain Pike again. Good, I'm glad. I'm glad. I didn't, didn't want to miss my opportunity because <laughs> I thought that might happen. All right, so let's... Uh, that's a great outside the box pick. I love it, Heather, going broad on the double round. And I too am going broad with my double round pick. My five words and a hashtag did not see that coming. Hashtag set phasers to twists. And it's the season two twists and surprises when contrasted to season one. And the episode I'm picking, which I'm picking right now, is If Memory Serves. And so we all know season one had lots of twists and reveals, and but we know that the combined group think of the internet had sleuthed a lot of them out before they were revealed. So we knew, everyone kind of knew Mira Lorker and Volk Tyler and a few other things were coming, you know, and Jonathan Frakes kind of spoiled that the Mirror Universe was coming. So a lot of those twists, which I love and enjoyed, were a little muted because of... Uh, kind of some pre-knowledge I think everyone had. So for me, that's why season two, I made a real, real effort to go into season two and not read any advanced stuff, not watch any trailers. I didn't watch really any trailers since like October going into the season. Just didn't watch one preview all season long. So all of these, they're really more reveals than twists. But every time one of these big moments came up, it just absolutely floored me, and I had no idea they were coming. I'm just going to rattle off a few. When they revealed Talos Four at the end of Lights and Shadows, I was like on the floor. Like, what? <laughs> what? We're going to go to Talos Four? Crazy. And then, you know, I kept, like I just said, I, I made sure that I didn't see any previews of If Memory Serves. I obviously knew there was going to be Talosians because there was so much scuttlebutt on the internet. But when they had that distant shot of Burnham outside the shuttle looking back down and a woman walking into the shuttle, again, that was the first moment in my head where I was like, oh, shit, we're going to see Vina. That's Vina <laughs> walking into that shuttle. And I absolutely was so floored. And then the Red Angel reveal with uh, Burnham's mom, no one really had that. So revisionist history will be that everybody predicted it and it was obvious, but that's not the case. No one knew, uh, saw that, that coming in that reveal. And then we just talked about the, the big moment of Through the Valley of Shadows. But my favorite reveal here, and we all knew it was coming. There was a big buildup to it. One of my, probably my favorite moment of the season was this, the amazing power in If Memory Serves of the rift between Burnham and Spock as kids. And I heard so many people say that they thought that this was a little bit underwhelming and I just don't get that. I think they, they, I think people who say that miss the biggest point, the reveal that Spock wanted to be more human and wanted to go to Earth and thought Michael would be his guide to show him his, his half of his humanity. And for her to deny him that, that rebuff, that was so massive. It was so powerful. It was so incredibly well filmed with the child actors and – Ethan Peck and Sonequa Martin-Green kind of bouncing back and forth in that uh, that flashback. Some brilliant writing, brilliant production. One of my favorite uh, moments there. And yeah, all these reveals for me throughout the season were, were amazing. So really broad picks. So I could talk about a lot of things. So a little bit of a cheat. But uh, Alex, what's your take on that one? 
you're not alone in that, Jim. I mean, you know, even even people like me who thrive off of speculating on <laughs> yeah. what's going to happen, like on my show every week, me and my guest at the end of the episode will give a theory about what's going to happen with either Discovery or the future of Star Trek. I didn't see pretty much any of this coming. They started to tease the season finale being, you know, big game-changing, canon-changing um, event. And so that, you know, I think at that point, people started to get an inkling that maybe the ending that we saw happen was going to be the ending that we would see on screen. But that was only because they kind of tipped us off. Yeah, that, that one, I didn't mention that one because we kind of had a feeling. <laughs> Yeah, like, but the rest of it, I mean, you know, the identity of the Red Angel, who could nobody predict it? And if anybody says they predicted it, they're a liar, that it would be, you know, Burnham's parents, uh, her mother, rather than, you know, Burnham herself, which was what the prevalent theory was at the time. Yeah, um, yeah they did such a good job this season of, of, of doing a really close hold on what the twists and turns would be. You know, it wasn't like... Um, uh, in season one where you know, even the Lorca as Mirror Universe capped in was something that had been floating around beginning like four episodes, five episodes before the reveal actually took place. Yeah. And a lot of people were just kind of twiddling their thumbs and waiting for, all right, well, when are you finally going to reveal it? Um, whereas there was nothing like that this season. And actually that made the twists all that more effective and it made the experience of watching the season a lot better because you weren't kind of watching with a checklist of, I'm waiting for this to happen and then I'm waiting for this to happen and then I'm waiting for this to happen because you just didn't have a checklist. There was no, you know, you were just able to watch it and 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 even for someone like me who does do a lot of thinking about what's coming next, it allowed me to have a very Jim Morehouse-esque experience of just going along for the ride because there really was no way of predicting what was going to come next. Yeah, I love the way you framed that. The <laughs> season one felt like a little bit of a checklist of things that that were coming not in, i don't mean that in a negative way at all because i love season one. Oh, totally and the execution of it was really really well done but like yeah. you kind of knew it was coming and so you were just like is this the episode where this is right. going to happen no all right then we'll wait yeah. Th- thanks jonathan frakes all right <laughs> <laughs> um heather what what's your take on the the twists and reveals um i i think you both probably covered it uh it it, it is it it made the season a lot more fun to watch because you didn't know what was going to happen. And even if you wanted to sit there and speculate, there were no clues. And it it was, or even when there were clues, like it it turned out being something completely different, but even like with uh, Michael's mother turning out to be the red angel you're like oh okay it wasn't michael all along then you find out a couple episodes later that there were two red angels and one is michael like i never expected that (laughs) yeah that's another cool reveal yep so yeah it, it 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 made it a lot more fun to watch because i want to go in it not looking for things but enjoying the ride and that that's what season two was so you, you you were just along for the ride wherever they took you and and it was it was awesome yep exactly right along for the ride with the red angel all right round two favorite character alex Thank all right know. tee up those defiant torpedoes <laughs> five word summary starfleet captain in every way hashtag hit it my pick for favorite character from season two is Captain Pike. And the episode I chose was uh, actually uh, episode two, New Eden. I'm really pleased we've had so much of an opportunity to talk about Through the Valley of Shadows because that was the other episode I was thinking about picking. So let's go from the end of the Pike story all the way back to the beginning of the Pike story um, and talk a little bit about New Eden uh, and his appearance there. I mean, coming off of the back of season one in which, you know, we had this captain who, you know, turned out to have been from the mirror universe, who was very ethically compromised. 
Um, and then to get Pike arriving on the show in Brother and immediately kind of hitting the ground running as being more of the sort of traditional Starfleet character, uh, captain character, but, but in many ways going even further than that. You know, I think um, we discovered through the course of this season that Christopher Pike is sort of the ideal Starfleet captain in every way, shape, and form. Um, and I think in some ways encapsulated many of the best qualities of all of the previous captains that we've seen. You know, he was... Um, he had a little bit of Kirk in him, he had a little bit of Picard in him, he had a little bit of Cisco, a little bit of Janeway, a little bit of Archer, um, and that all culminated together into just this fabulous character. I mean, and you know, let's not discount the performance that Anson Mount provided uh, for this character throughout the course of the season. And, and, and the reason why I picked New Eden was because it was one of those episodes where you really did get to kind of see multiple sides to the character. You, know, you had the Kirk moment at the end where he beams down and offers the power converter uh, in exchange for the helmet camera, you know, which sort of lightly violated the prime directive. But then throughout the rest of the episode, he was, you know, while he was on the away team, very much more of the Picard character, you know, where Kirk was the one who would sort of storm in and be like, your religion is, is ridiculous. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, and, and sort of, uh, preach a sense, uh, a, a more enlightened philosophy. Pike was much more, came at it from the perspective of, no, we have to fit in with this culture, be respectful of the culture that they have, uh, which, you know, felt more like kind of the Picard model of Captain C. And so it was, it was really great to see the character kind of embody the, kind of different traits from the previous captains, but in a way that felt perfectly authentic to this character and didn't feel like he was, oh, this is a Picard moment and oh, this is a Kirk moment. It all felt like Pike moments, but Pike moments that echoed uh, previous characters. And from that episode forward, I was totally on board with the character of Pike. And, and as we've talked about at length in this episode already, you know, the way that that story for that character developed over the course of the season was, was incredibly satisfying. I mean, I would love to have uh, a, a Pike show, uh, but if we don't get one, I, I, I am very, very pleased with the story that's been told over the course of this season. And in some ways, as much as I just want more, 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 um, to tell additional stories of Pike after we got this really tight arc for the character that does draw him from the cage on one hand to the menagerie on the other would, I think, detract from some of the power of this story. So there may also be an argument for just saying, let's leave this alone now. You know, we, we've, we've told this character's story. But what an amazing story to tell and, and what a ride to have gone on. Totally agree. Heather and I were actually talking about that before we started recording that it'd be great to have another season of the, or another series of Pike, but the reality is we got this one season. It's perfect. Leave them wanting more as Iris Stephen bear says. And I'm, I'm kind of in the camp that I actually probably would prefer not to have it. Of course, if they did it, I would be thrilled, but this season was the perfect Pike moment and we have it and it's never going to change. I love that. Heather, what we already talked a little bit about it with uh, your number three double round pick, but what's uh, any more thoughts on Pike? Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad you picked new Eden as the episode uh, because I, I think it does a lot to show uh, kind of give you a little bit more about his backstory because he talked about his father at the beginning of the episode oh, and yeah. how uh, he was a science teacher, but he also taught, religion and how that blended into the story that they told in the episode and you got to understand more about his motivations and how how he thinks when he approaches things just because of that little tiny section of backstory so yeah I, I I like Jim said we were talking about this beforehand and uh, we both completely agree with you um, I love Pike I would love to see more of Pike but the the story that they took him on in this season uh just was fit so well with his character and it, it really told you everything you need to know about him so yeah. i would be perfectly okay if we don't see any more pike too. could not be any more satisfying as is so totally heather what's your favorite character pick in round two Okay, uh, five word summary. Nothing is ever truly gone. Hashtag, here's my hand. 
I cheated. <laughs> My favorite character pick is Lieutenant Commander Paul Stamets and Dr. Hugh Colbert. I love it. Stamets and Colbert. That is awesome. So I don't really think you could talk about one without talking about mm-hmm. the other because their relationship is, is so entrenched with each other and their story is so much about each other too so uh the episode i picked was saints of imperfection awesome. uh, episode five where we got to see uh colber be found in the mycelial network and ultimately resurrected in their network uh in a new body but with his his same mind and emotions and like these two like they've said since season one that these two are on an epic love story and you really see that throughout season two um you don't get to see a whole lot of them because they're very much secondary characters um compared to michael and pike and ash and saru uh but every scene that they have together the amount of emotion that they convey in their scene just keeps you invested in these characters that you want to see more you want to know what happens to them and i'm a huge character person but i love characters where i want to know more so that's why stamets and culver yeah Yeah, i i love that you picked this so we can kind of broaden our scope into their story line i love saints of imperfection i think they did that really well it's a great tilly episode this, this story was so emotional all season long, and I think I thought the payoff in such sweet sorrow part two was really was really great. I think the injury to Stamets and the Colbert interaction there, and then now they're in the thirty first century together. I love it. I I love this storyline. I love what they did to kind of rebuild it from the start of the season. Awesome pick, uh, Alex. What's your uh, what's your take? I agree. As a complete story, it's 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 really fabulous. Yeah. Um, you know, the the Culver character uh, being resurrected in Saints of Imperfection, then kind of going through this process of learning what it was to be a be the same person in a different body, and you kind of saw this process for the character of him trying to embrace being an entirely different person and that not really feeling all that comfortable than him kind of, well, starting off with, let me start that again. Um, you start with the character and, you know, everybody's pushing him to kind of be the same person and he doesn't really feel comfortable with that. And then he kind of decides he, he's a different person. And then there's a scene in the red angel where he goes and visits Cornwell and Cornwell basically says, you know, you're an entirely different person now and you should make decisions accordingly. And, And you see in that scene, in addition to Wilson Cruz being very snappily dressed in that episode, um, <laughs> that uh, that he also doesn't feel all that comfortable with being a totally new person um, and being confronted with somebody treating him like a totally new person didn't feel right to him either. Um, and that then kind of leads us towards the end of the season in which I think he's gotten to a place in which he has reconciled that, yes, he has a new body, but also he is the same person mentally and emotionally that he was um and that was just a very satisfying complete arc we maybe didn't spend as much time on it as i would have liked over the course of the season but that's just a product of discovery has lots of characters and lots of stories to tell but every scene we got between the two characters was fabulous and really exciting to see where the next chapter for the stamets and Culver story goes yeah the pieces were all there it may not have been a lot, like you said, or the way you framed it, but the, all the pieces were there for this great story. And I, I love the scene where uh, Colbert goes after Tyler. I think it was in Light in Shadows. And after their fisticuffs at the end, Tyler's just like, who do you think you're talking to, man, when he's referencing not knowing himself? <laughs> so, totally. so powerful. Great pick, Heather. I'm so glad you picked them. All right, my number two pick will not tread new ground. Five words and a hashtag. I totally grok this Spock. Hashtag. There might be something to this character. 
it is Spock. I love Spock. I mean, what what else can you say? And I'm so boring. I picked the Red Angel again. It's the first time I've done this in Trek Race history. But I picked the same episode because I was looking at options. And it's the same episode I picked for Sonequa. But I just love Spock in this episode. We talked about it a little bit when Alex chose Ethan Peck and the Red Angel as well. And Alex, I'm in the exact same place you are. I was in this place where I didn't think we needed to have another Spock. It was like, you know, it it just wasn't that excited about it until we see him on screen and we see this version of him. And I loved it. Ethan Peck blew me out of the water. He's just a superb actor. And the chess scene with Burnham is really one of the main reasons I I picked this. It's uh, (laughs) that, that showdown, that back and forth of uh, Spock kind of showing his emotion and purposely kind of tanking the game and Burnham getting upset before Spock smashes the the game and and just incredible stuff. But I think one of the most successful things that they did this season in all of discovery was that Burnham and Spock relationship, which we've talked about a little bit, that payoff and if memory serves for me is just crazy just incredible the way they they told that story and then at the end we get this moment in such sweet sorrow where Burnham implores him to go find his opposite and go find the person that can help him be as complete as he can be and obviously a uh, unspoken reference to Captain James T. Kirk (laughs) so cool I was really really happy watching that scene thought it was great closure for for that character and for that whole storyline in season two. So we talked about this a bit, uh, Heather, any uh, quick take on Spock? Yeah. Like, like I said earlier, <laughs> uh, he's, he's done such a wonderful job as Spock. I I'm with you on that scene. And if memory serves the payoff between the relationship, I thought that, that, that fit well, to me like that that's honestly when I was thinking about what had to have happened between the two of them it was something like that theme so it 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 made a lot of sense to me that it was a confrontation like that and that that Spock we got to see his human side in this season which was really nice because like especially in, in TOS a lot of a lot of TOS you don't really see that he he's very Vulcan and he doesn't really embrace the human side it's not really till the movies that he does more so um I I liked being able to see both sides of of the character and I thought it was done really well yeah uh Alex any other uh, thoughts on Spock I will also just quickly say I was such a big fan of the of the Spock Burnham scene in If Memory Serves that up until like 10 seconds before you asked me for my double round pick, that was my pick. And then I changed it <laughs> at the last moment. Incredible. I, I assist that moment. And again, just so everyone can focus in on it. The fact that Spock wanted to be more human is just a game changer. And the, he literally says, I want to go to earth with you. And it's just that, uh, it kills me. It kills me thinking about that. And it, really is a perfect retcon or whatever you want to say it's a perfect fit for the spot character that we've known for 50 years awesome job by the discovery writers okay let's go to our round one picks and our favorite episodes can't wait to hear this alex what's your number one episode for season two of discovery Five word summary, cage sequel and menagerie prequel, hashtag humming plants. It is season two, episode eight, if memory serves. I love this episode. Um, It was my favorite of the season by far. It encapsulated everything that Discovery did really well over its first two seasons, being a prequel show and taking advantage of an opportunity to revisit storylines from the original show and add depth and power and gravitas to what we had seen already. This created, you know, you didn't necessarily feel as though the cage needed something between it and the menagerie until you watch this episode. (laughs) And then you realize that it was absolutely essential that there was a linking element between the two it creates this 
perfect story of, of showing the arc for Pike, of showing the arc for Vina, and seeing how the Talosians have a really strong impact on these two characters kind of throughout the course of their lives, and I think makes the the kind of closing moments of the menagerie all the more powerful as a result and just like we were talking about in the production design round you know this episode does a really fabulous job of kind of melding the discovery and the original series aesthetic i mean the talos 4 feel you know it's not shot on the same set as the cage because it was a location shoot but all the elements are there the sky color, the humming blue plants, the sort of soundscape of being there, the design of the Talosians, which was a pretty faithful update of the design, you know, the costume design, the the pendant that the keeper wore, um, uh, the makeup design, also very similar. Um, uh, and also just a really tight episode that really contributed to the overall story, even though, you know, you, you kind of felt like going into it, oh, this could just be, they're just looking for an opportunity to kind of shoehorn the Talosians in because we've got Pike, so wouldn't it be fun to, you know, to, to, to revisit the events of the cage as well? And it wasn't that at all. It was a really... It doesn't feel like that at all, man. No, it was such a pivotal episode for the story of the season, for, for putting Burnham and Spock together, for having them confront the issues in their relationship that then set up that relationship over the whole back half of the season for Pike to begin to confront both his past and then eventually his future um, and what that would mean for him. The episode was just far and away for me, the high point of the season. And, and there was no other pick for me that could have been the, the best episode. Incredible. Uh, Heather, what's your take on if memory serves? So I love this episode. It is like number one in like, five different categories on my secondary systems list. It was my hardest cut. Yep. Um, I, I just think it, it, it does uh, something that Star Trek has never really done before, but I hope this isn't like sacrilege or something. I'm going to mention another TV show on Trek ranks, <laughs> but uh, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. And one of the things Doctor never heard Who of it. Doctor Who does really well is that they, um, especially with the newer series, they've taken like just kind of plot holes and empty spaces in the older series and they've inserted stories into them. And that's what this episode is to me. Like it takes the space between the cage and the menagerie and it inserts this story that connects it all together. And it, 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 yeah, it, it's one of the best hours of Trek ever. I don't want you with me. Don't you understand that? You are my sister. You're my sister. You, you are helping the human part of me learn to the express. The human part of you is so small it won't make a difference in your life. Why can't you get it through your head? I don't want a freak like you as a brother. I love you. Love? You're not capable of love. I am. No, you are not. You are Vulcan. And you will always be cold and distant, like a moon somewhere. You're not worth my effort. But you promised you would teach me the ways of Earth. That maybe we could live there one day. Don't you get it? I don't want you in my life. Stop following me. You weird little half-breed. Yeah, it's also my number two pick. It's why it's on my secondary systems too. It's an amazing episode. We talked about it enough with the, I, I mean, that oh, that Spock Burnham scene as kids, I absolutely love. But uh, I love the production design here. They have, The one thing you didn't mention, Alex, was the forced perspective hallways. I love that they, they have those still. And the amazing moment where Vina shows up to talk to Pike on yes. the Enter on the Enterprises. Yes. I mean on Discovery is absolutely so cool, so well filmed and just the way they produce that, very powerful stuff. Amazing, amazing episode. One of my all time favorites for sure. Uh okay, Heather, let's go to your number one pick. What's your top episode of Discovery season two? 
Okay. Five word summary is we are coming with you. Hashtag today is a good day to die. It is such sweet sorrow parts one and two. All right, cheater. I love it. You're cheating again. I love it. <laughs> the more discovery I can talk about, the better, right? Exactly. Uh, but I, I, I always have a soft spot for season finales, especially I love just the, the culmination of everything that happens throughout the season. And I think this one... Uh, just hits every note it, and it does it so well it doesn't feel forced it doesn't feel rushed um they they actually were originally going to make it one episode and thankfully made the choice to expand the story and make it two episodes so you really feel like you have a lot of closure on everything that's happened and where the show is going from here um it has so many so many characters in it. Um, I I love Poe. I was so excited when Poe, uh, they ended up on Zahia and we got to see Poe again and she's just so much more amazing than she was in the short trek. Um, giving Georgiou snark uh, <laughs> after Georgiou was trying to snark her. Mm -hmm. So you have a time crystal, which I've only ever read about and no method by which to activate it. And you have a time suit. Which genius built that? My mom. I had a special mom, too. Ugh. So you want to use the suit to travel through time with this ship flying behind you, yes? Yes. And then you want to cut the ship loose and come back alone. This endeavor would be rather ridiculous if Michael intended to return with the ship. One of the fun things about becoming queen of the most politically relevant planet in the galaxy is that I don't have to listen to any snark. I made it an actual law. And then in part two, when you have like all the battle groups out in the middle of this huge drone battle are being led by women. Uh, there's Poe in her, in her shuttle. Uh, there's Serana in the bio, mm -hmm. bowel fighters leading Kelpians to the charge, which was an incredible surprise. I didn't nope. expect that. <laughs> it was amazing to see her again. And then there is our wonderful, awesome chancellor, which I already talked about earlier. Um, but when she says today is a good day to die, you just get that Klingon nostalgia that, oh, this is so exciting. And I love the part when uh, she gets knocked around and starts laughing because she, she <laughs> sheds blood uh, during her chancellorship. Love that we are headed in an entirely different direction, uh, just sending the, the, the ship into the future and giving them a fresh start with something very new and 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 the journey is open from here as to what's going to happen and where they're going to go um but it, it left me feeling so very excited and emotional and i i couldn't not pick it <laughs> i love it i'm still i'm still processing the finale it's uh incredible i love I, one of my favorite things though about the two parters when uh, Mihani Ikahali Kapo shows up. I love that character. She really was amazing, and uh, the interaction with Tilly was was really cool, but incredible. We talked a little bit about it earlier, but the the setup for where we're going in season three is just bonkers, crazy. Can't wait to see how they play that out. Uh, Alex, any uh, quick take on such sweet sorrow? Totally ambitious. Uh, love the direction that the show is going in. Um, love that they kind of have the courage to do something like that. And I am a huge sucker for a surprise team up. So then you had the the Enterprise arrives and then the Klingons arrive and then yeah. and you've got Poe and then the the um Serana arrives. Like that's just uh that is that uh, yeah, that that totally uh, uh fires me up. Yep. Love it. And I like the uh all the stuff with Burnham and the, the flashbacks on the Red Angels. So good good recap of the season. Okay, my number one pick. We were just talked about it a little bit. My five words and a hashtag 
By the way, this is my number one episode in the last episode of Trek Rank. So two straight. That's never happened before. Have five words of the hashtag. Do you fly amongst the stars? Hashtag is all Jacob needs to know. And New Eden is my favorite Discovery Season 2 episode. I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite episodes of Trek ever. If memory serves, was very close. But I just fell in love with this episode instantaneously. And for sure, it's one of the one or two best of the series for me because I still love Context is for Kings from that first season. But it's just an awesome totally standalone type episode that also weaves into the the grand story of the of the season two arc and i know alex was talking about it with his pike pick because it's a perfect fit for that but my my main takeaway from this episode which i'll just say again is this character jacob the episode doesn't have a bad guy right it just has this guy jacob you don't really understand his motivation and then you just realize he just wants to he just wants to know the truth. That's all he wants to know. Just tell me if you guys are from earth and that I'm not crazy. And they do. And the stuff with Pike is amazing. And it's just a great, great, great episode. Do you have a ship? Do you uh, fly uh, among the stars? Yeah. And Earth. Well, we're, we're part of a galactic federation now. Dedicated to peace, exploration, and protecting places such as your planet. Jacob, we cannot intervene. Your society has to evolve in its own way. My entire family spent their whole lives hoping to get a confirmation that what we believed was true. And you gave me that answer. Something none of them ever got. And that is enough for me. Uh, Heather, what's your take on New Eden? Uh, yeah, New Eden is a incredible episode. Um, <laughs> I'm going to admit something here. I, I, I'm a bit ornery. <laughs> so uh, when New Eden first premiered and I was like, oh, yeah, it was really nice, really enjoyed it. And then it, it kind of got the reputation like uh, magic to make the sanest man go mad did a season in which everybody focused on that episode that it was the most trek episode of discovery and when someone tells me that that makes me not want to like it as ornery much. <laughs> ornery so so you're going with the contrarian i love it okay uh, but no no it, re it really is a good episode it it's the the whole balance between faith and 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 science and the the balance between the a and b plot in that episode which was there were some episodes this year where it seemed like there was a lot going on like there was at least three or four different stories going on at the same time yeah. but new eden is very balanced between one story and the other story uh so yeah I, you're 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 gonna be doing a donut inside an asteroid field <laughs> alex anything to add on new eden that you already talked about a little bit it is my number two episode for the season um i don't think it was the most star trek of all of the discovery episodes but i think it was the most traditional of the star trek episodes hmm. in the sense hmm. that it it much more closely aped the structure of Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise episodes than Discovery has up to this point. Not to say that that's better than the way that Discovery has done its its seasons and its episodes. It's just different and much more modern. Um, but that episode definitely felt like it had the it had the most structural similarities to a late nineteen nineties, early two thousands episode of Star Trek. But loved it. Nice, tight, contained stories great guest star that had a really powerful um arc you know it was a one and done you told the whole story and you felt very satisfied moving away from that planet yeah new eden was just really really fabulous yeah i like that framing that is more the most traditional is probably a, a good way to frame it but 
just so we're clear, like if if they had made Jacob like a typical, stereotypical bad guy, I would never have liked it as much. The, one of the things I love about it so much is that he's just a guy trying to get the answers. Oh, the, the, back to that knowledge theme. So just a guy who just wanted the knowledge. Okay, I love these picks. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Let's run through. Anybody got any quick uh, secondary systems picks, Alex? Um, nothing really that we haven't already talked about. Uh, New Eden would have been my second pick for favorite character. Sneaker Martin Green would have been my secondary pick for favorite performer. I guess the one we've not spent a ton of time talking about that I think it would be worth at least calling out is the fabulous design for the Enterprise Bridge, um, which I'm sure will be in the picks of many a person who submits on Twitter for this episode. So that'll be fun to read. Um, But just, again, another really fabulous design that mashes together the 60s and 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 this decade's aesthetic. I'm glad you brought that up because I did not have that on my list. Uh, and it's amazing. I love that. Heather, how about you? Any quick ones you want to reference? Um, a, a lot of mine were referenced already, like the production design on Talus 4, um, the, the fact that we were on Talus 4, and if memory serves, <laughs> yeah. like I said, that came up with second choice and a lot of different characters. Um, like I said, I love smaller characters, so I wanted to mention a lot of the, the, the smaller characters that I, I love throughout the season. Um, Poe, I already talked about Poe a little bit, and Serana, uh, Jet Reno, uh, who is fantastic, and I'm so glad she's still on the ship and alive, and we're going to see her in season three. Um, Tanavik, who is uh, Laurel and Vok's son, uh, and guided Pike on his journey in Through the Valley of Shadows. I think that was a really interesting Klingon character, and not your typical Klingon. (laughs) Commander Non, uh, she's she's wonderful and she's a great addition to the cast. Um, Admiral Cornwell, who rest in peace, uh, gave her life to save the Enterprise in that last episode. Um, she she has been one of my favorite characters throughout the first two seasons, so I'm sad to see her go. And Arium in the episode yes. Project Daedalus, um, as much as she is. A smaller secondary character um it was really cool to see uh, a, a lot of her backstory in that episode and just see her connection amongst the rest of the crew and her sacrifice as well so she, control didn't end up taking over discovery yeah you can hear my cat in the background <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that's my list of smaller characters I wanted to mention, uh, and that's about it. We love cats on Trek Ranks. That, I'm glad you r- rattled off all those characters because they all deserve a quick mention. So I got just a few more. You mentioned Reno. I love the scenes in in Oval for Caron Car- with uh, Tilly, Reno, and Stamets when they're trying to work out that that problem in engineering or in the spore engineering area. Love those scenes. I also wanted to, you mentioned Gersha Phyllis is one of your picks and I was going to do a shout out to all of Spock's amazing costumes. They were incredible all season long. And I'm just going to do one that a quick, I love this location that this location shoot they have in Toronto. They used it for brother and they used it for the red angel. It's like some kind of big, huge abandoned indoor outdoor warehouse or hangar or something but it is just a cool looking set. They do do a lot of cool things with it. And the production design and the red angel when they're capturing the red angel is absolutely incredible. Okay. Let's move into our regeneration cycle so we can run through some quick stats and a recap of our picks. Computer activate regeneration cycle alcoves beta and gamma. Okay, Alex, recap your top five picks. Production design element was the Captain Pike uh, disability chair from Through the Valley of Shadows. Performer was Ethan Peck as Spock in The Red Angel. Dubbo Round was the appearance of novel references throughout Discovery Season 2, and my pick for that was Such Sweet Sorrow Part 2. Favorite character was Captain Pike from the episode New Eden, and my favorite episode for Star Trek Discovery Season 2 was If Memory Serves. Spectacular, deep cut list there. Heather, how about you? What's your recap your five picks? 
Okay, production design was the Constitution class uniforms uh, designed by Gersha Phillips for the season two premiere brother. Uh, performer was Mary Chifo as our Chancellor Laurel in episode three, Point of Light. Dabo Round was our wild card of the season, Captain Christopher Pike, uh, with the episode being Through the Valley of Shadows. The character was Paul Stamets and Hugh Culver, and the episode Saints of Imperfection. And favorite episode was the two-part season finale, Such Sweet Sorrow. Lots of cheating there. Two episodes for your number one and two characters for your round two. I love it. Okay. My five picks for production design round five was the Data Sphere from an oval for Charon. Round four pick for performer was Sonequa Martin-Green in The Red Angel my Daba round pick in round three was all the twisty reveals throughout the season episode, If Memory Serves. My favorite character in round two was Spock from the Red Angel as well. And my number one episode all through the season continued to be New Eden. I love that Trek episode. All right, so we actually have some interesting stats here. We don't actually have any pure duplicates although you guys both picked pike uh one in the double round one his favorite character so there were three pike references as well and i'm going to count pike's chair so there was two spock picks overall we had six characters mentioned and overall there was 10 different episodes out of 14 mentioned in four in 15 pick so that's pretty amazing that 10 episodes got highlighted the most was red angel with three through the valley of shadows with two and new eden with two so love that breakdown love this topic love season two of discovery i'm going to ask you guys a quick question we're not going to get into it but we're just going to do a quick poll what was your favorite season alex go two and heather two I think I'm one. I think I'm still one. I, uh, really? I asked the question. I don't even really have an answer. <laughs> but honestly, I think I would. I think I'm. I. I don't know. I don't know. No, maybe it's two. Maybe it's one. I don't know. We're gonna move on to the I temporal. Think <laughs> both seasons are so uniquely different that For it's sure. really hard to compare them. Yeah, it's tough. It is different. Yeah. So I don't have an answer, but I made you guys do it. Okay, we're gonna move into our temporal causality loop via michael burnham's mom traveling through here with some time crystal so let's jump back to episode 48 in our temporal causality loop the enterprise has been caught up in a temporal causality loop and i suspect that something similar may have happened to you so our temporal causality loop this week is fantastic. We received a subspace transmission from Melanie, who is on Twitter at ShuttlePod2. And we've been interacting with her on Twitter for a while now, and we love her picks. So she contacted us with an amazing list of top five chill-inducing moments from episode 48 of Trek Ranks. So here is her amazing subspace transmission. Hi, Jim. Hello, folks at Tricorder Transmissions. This is Melanie here at ShuttlePod2 on Twitter with more chill-inducing moments for Trek Ranks Episode 48. This is my Enterprise version. I have six of them, and of course, there's many, many more that are not on my list. Number six, in home, when Archer and the crew are by the landing pad outdoor auditorium at Starfleet Command, after the Zindi War, and Archer says, it's good to be home. Number five, Tara Prime, the emotion in Hoshi's voice when she hears Archer call in and says, yes, Captain, seconds before she was ordered to destroy Paxton's base. Number four, an observer effect, when Archer says to the Organians in Sick Bay, if you want to understand compassion, try experiencing it for yourself. Number three, in Terra Prime, Archer's speech before the delegates when he says, up to about 100 years ago, humans wondered, are we alone? And about making profound discoveries within us. I love that whole speech. 
Number two, in Azadi Prime, when Archer says, of all the captains who will sit in this chair, none will be as proud as I am right now. Sniff, sniff. Number one, Terra Prime, strip into Paul's scene after baby Elizabeth dies. What more can be said about this intense scene? Sob. That's it. Thanks again. Take care. Shuttlepod 2, out. All right, I love that list. And as I always say, and I tease at the beginning of the show, hey, if you want to be on Trek Ranks, this is how you do it. Just leave us a voicemail message. I've already contacted Melanie, and we're working on getting her on the show in the next couple of months. So, so we know she's going to be great based on that list. So as always, big thanks to everyone for all the great responses to Trek Ranks. Keep them coming. You can send them to me at Trek Ranks on Twitter. And we also want to hear from you. So put your own list together of top five Discovery Season 2 moments. Give us a call at the Tricorder Transmissions at 609-512-5527. That's 609-512-LLAP. And hopefully you can uh, be featured on the next episode of Trek Ranks. And on the next episode of Trek Ranks, We're doing one of our crazy out there topics. It's one of those weird ones that just hit me in the middle of the day. And I realized that would make a great topic for a Star Trek conversation. So we're doing our top five shapes. Boom. That's it. Top five shapes. No other clarification than that. So Alex and Heather, what's the first thing to pop in your mind as a potential pick for a top five Star Trek shape? Alex, what do you got? For me, I think it's got to be the Romulan Empire logo and the Mm -hmm. shape of the bird with holding the two planets, the sort of next generation uh, Romulan Empire logo. It's so iconic. It's so aggressive. It's so kind of in your face. It's just, it's just really fabulous. I'm a huge sucker for all the kind of symbology of the, of the franchise. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that would be one of my picks. It will definitely be referenced that every race and alien race in Star Trek has their own logo. Even the Borg. We love that. <laughs> Even the Borg have their own logo. Heather, what's your, what's a shape that you might include on your list? Well, the first thing that popped into my head was the uh, Tholian crystal-like ships. Oh, yeah. Love those Tholian ships. Because I, 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 I just, I love the Tholians because we don't know a whole lot about them, but they're really uh, unique and dangerous kind of species <laughs> and the the fact that their ships are shaped like crystals and then they have like crystalline bodies uh yeah i was thinking crystals i got crystals on the brain so no i that the tholian ships are a super cool unique look and shape all right it's going to be an awesome topic we're going to have jen tift and ross webster of the snap trek podcast on for that show we're finally getting Ross Webster on Trek ranks. We've been interacting with him for a couple of years. He is uh, the Borg, T-E-H Borg, Star Trek 1701, no vowels. Love that guy. Love Jen. It's going to be great to get them back on. And don't forget to check out Snap Trek. It is an awesome podcast. Second. Second, yes. It's spectacular. Third. <laughs> all right so before we wrap it up here a huge thanks to alexander t perry and heather kirby great to have you guys on the show any any final trek thoughts or any final discovery season two thoughts you want to throw out there i'm looking forward to diving into the 31st century i'll see you back here next year <laughs> and we'll talk about all of the things we learned that is charting a new course for the star trek canon yeah i i love discovery and i love where this new golden age of Trek is headed. So I'm excited for what's to come. You know what I'm excited about is that before we get to the top five Discovery season three moments, we'll be doing top five Picard season one moments. Oh, oh my God. God. I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. I get chills just thinking about that. It's coming soon, people. All right, so thanks again, everyone, for engaging with us here on episode 55 of the Trek Ranks podcast. As always, I want to close by saying I'm looking forward to standing with you. (laughs) I'm looking forward to standing with you again here in this place where I belong. 
that was my cat book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to use that one. We're going to use that one. For the asteroid to exit at the correct angle, I would have to execute a sustained circular drift. A donut. You would be doing a donut in a starship. That's true. Is this possible? Yes. Hi there, thanks again for listening. If you're cruising the galaxy looking for even more Trek talk, why not visit our good friends Bill and Dan over at TrekGeeks.com? They've got a great podcast that covers a wide range of Star Trek topics, so you're sure to find something you'll love. And if you're in the mood for some awesome tunes, then you really need to head over to FiveYearMission.net. The guys are writing a song for every episode of the original series, and each one is absolutely brilliant. So that's TrekGeeks.com and FiveYearMission.net. Check them out today. of Spock's amazing costumes. Ah. <laughs> He's literally in front of the mic. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. Stop, just stay down. I had to move him because he was on my notes. <laughs> See, I, I, I always think my cat is loud and then your cat comes on and just screams he 10 is, times louder than mine. He is just an alley cat and I am always recording at the alley cat time where he just wants to prowl around the house and look for a fight with the other cat. Oh my god. <laughs> he is just like he is and he's super scrawny and skinny. He's just the stereotypical badass cat. <laughs> awesome. Love me some book.